I know exactly what you're thinking. It is that time. We can finally take advantage of machine learning and look at some images and find that cat, that dog, that widget, that whatever it is you're trying to find in the image. But now it's the effort. How am I going to be able to go in and tag so many images so that the results are so good? Well, it turns out there's a tool for that. It's called the Visual Object Tagging Tool. We've got one of the authors right on this episode of Dev Radio. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Microsoft Dev Radio. You're going to like this one. We're talking to Ari Sabrina. We're all the way to Israel today. I know. This is exciting. Welcome, this Ari. It's super exciting. Thank you guys for having me. Now, Ari, uh, man, I have liked you ever since we brought you on board. It, has, it feels like it's been an eternity, but it hasn't yeah. been an eternity. You've, you've only been with us, what, a decade? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Going on the fifth year, right? Yeah. It's unbelievable. I'm and uh, you and I, we were on the same team. You were here in New York, and then all yeah. of a sudden, you're over in Israel, and now you're working on what has to be the sweetest tool ever. I'm glad we have this entire show to talk about this tool because there are a lot of people I know that are interested in it. And, hey, there's not enough out there really to get people to be like masters of this. So today is Jedi Master Training on this uh, VOTT tool that you are one of the primary authors, maybe the primary author. Absolutely. Well, it's absolutely a team effort. Great, great work from across the team, but I'm really excited to tell you guys and show you guys what we've been up to here in Israel. All right, cool. All right, before we start talking about the tool or anything like that, tell us who you are so that we can get the whole gist of who Ari is. Perfect. So let's, I'll give a little bit of background. So as you said, I'm based in Israel. I've been here for about two, almost two and a half years. Uh, before that, I worked with... Uh, USDX Microsoft, that's the developer evangelism uh, arm of Microsoft in New York City, working with cloud client developers. And for the past two years, I've been here in Israel uh, focusing on partnering with startups to solve their critical challenges. And then we open source these solutions, build out these scalable tools, and uh, travel the world to speak and share the learning. So it's been incredible. In the past year, I've been, uh, well, I guess year and a half, almost 13 different countries. And it's just been incredible to see, share learnings, and see real-world global impact coming out of such a small country. There's a lot of passport stamps. That's nice. <laughs> Tell me about it, right? <laughs> okay, uh, let's back up. We'll just tell everybody right now this is the, the visual tagging tool, but let's start with, um, let's start with where, this, um, where this problem started, why you had to create an application in the first place to do this, because it seems like something the developer could do on their own, and the truth is they can, right? Absolutely. Well, so the problem comes around essentially object detection. And I'm, I'll take a step back, uh, come to ex explain the problem. When we deal with uh, image processing and trying to extract information from uh, image data, there are a couple different ways that we can go about doing this. There's classification where we try to take a frame of a video or a given image and we try to identify whether there's a given object in it, like a cat in the object. There's localization, where we try to identify exactly not only that there's a cat in the object, but where in the image uh, the cat is, right? And then we have on top of that object detection. Object detection is, let's say we have multiple cats or multiple, or also dogs or many other animals. It allows us to localize and identify where each of these items are, uh, objects are, within a given image or video frame. And when you think about this, this is traditionally a really, really hard problem. But over the past two years, there's been a lot of amazing development and new advancements and new algorithms that have enabled us to do this in production real time. The challenge is, is to do that, you need large amounts of data. And traditionally, that's been something that's been prohibitive, a very big prohibitive area of entry. You'll notice that most times when you see demos of these object detection systems, they're detecting people or cats or dogs or birds, just like we're talking about. But in reality, most of the real-world problems, they don't deal with cats or dogs. They deal with real-world objects. Mm -hmm. And so the need came from the ability. We, we, really, we worked with a couple companies that needed to uh, 
identify real world objects that weren't necessarily in these main data sets that you train out these models on. Uh, the other aspect of it was some of these objects are, like for instance, you can detect people pretty well, but sometimes it's contextual to the images that they're trained on. So we wanted to provide the ability for people to leverage those types of models and customize them exactly to what they were working on. Uh, in this case, it started with uh, two companies. Uh, the first company was called uh, Perfecto. It's an uh, Israeli startup. They're actually really, really cool. What they do is uh, they're a drone company, and they develop these drones that they use for agricultural landscaping to identify, to count things like windmills so that they can uh, tell in a given area and use it for that data for uh, financial predictions. And they wanted to be able to detect windmills. Well, there's no windmills in these data sets. So we had to, and they found sending lots of information to people all across the world to tag for them uh, defeated the purpose of having this, you know, useful data for themselves. So we wanted, we worked with them to build out the first iteration of the tool. From there, you know, we found a lot of startups for each one had a different business use case and a different feature and a different thing to add. And we're able to use that to leverage something that now is a very powerful Microsoft open source tool that I'm hoping the community will be able to embrace at large. All right, so let's back up, make sure I understand, because this is some, this is both complicated and amazingly straightforward. So first of all, we've waited for a long time for hardware to be able to process all this stuff. And we've gotten to a point where hardware really can deliver. We've waited for all the algorithms to catch up so we can really start processing this efficiently. And the algorithms have caught up and they now can also deliver. Now the next part is for us to be able to say, okay, I need you to go find a windmill in an image. But of course, these, this hardware and, and these algorithms have no idea what a windmill is. Now it's the, it's the effort of how do we train these algorithms to be able to find these unique things that are specific to what I'm looking for that they have no, like right now I could go to the, the custom vision service and I could say, is this an apple or is this an orange? Well, that's already got an existing data set that somebody went through all the hard work of saying apple, 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 orange, 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 apple, apple. Now I give it an apple and it says there's an apple. And that's what you're saying. Those are the fun examples, but those aren't the real world examples where I need to find something very specific like a widget that happens to show up inside that image Absolutely. that I have. Absolutely. And, and just to elaborate on that, what's so really nice about the tool and the kind of work that we've done is that we're able to work and coordinate with great teams at Microsoft, like the custom, uh, custom vision service team, and they're able to incorporate the learning. So they, in the latest release of the custom vision service, they actually support object detection, and we're mm -hmm. able to bake integration of this tool to export it to yeah. the custom vision service. But in addition to that, there's still really some unique opportunities for using these types of tooling because they provide you annotation, not just of you know, images, but of videos as well. And the ability to have this amazing active learning feedback loop, which we'll get into in a little bit, that I think really provides value for everyone. Mm. And let's make sure everybody knows this too. This, there's a lot of JavaScript frameworks out there. There are a lot of great ideas, a lot of open source projects out there. This may be similar to that, but this is not the same. If you go into our official docs and look at how to do object tagging, there is this tool. So we're really talking about something that's not, a, you know, this is not a fly-by-night good idea. This is really on the trajectory of being the standard go-to for every company that needs to do object detected detection yep. in, a, in a serious way. Yep, so the company is behind this, and this is something that's integrated not just in the documentation, but if you go to spin up today a uh, DSVM, uh, that's the data science virtual machine, or like a deep learning virtual machine. You'll find the tool baked into yeah. these images. Yeah. So it's something that we're seeing more and more companies using, and it would be great again to see that, to share that learning and that access for the developer community as well. Okay, so the hard part is object detections. We 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 were categorizing uh, images. We've done that for years, actually. Whether or not you know, it's, it's the season of spring or not, or whether or not it's the season of fall, we can figure out whether or not that image is there. Then object detection is, you know, whether or not, you know, there's a dog in the picture, like you said. And then we get into this idea of, I think you call it localization or segmentation. Is that the same thing? So these are three different areas, and, and you're pretty much right on. Essentially, the idea of classification, as you said, being able to tell what season it is. And we had some really big advances on that about four years ago. Yeah. Then 
the next step was, again, as you said, localization, detection, being able to detect where something is in the object. And segmentation is the step that's going one step beyond. That's when now you know and have a bounding box, mm. as you can see, right yeah. around yeah. the given objects that you're looking for. Segmentation gives you the mask. It essentially tells you where is the boundary. If you imagine, like, I have this bounding box, instead of having the bounding box, I have a trace around me, which tells me where I am versus where's the background. And, and there's a different right. value. Again, that's still developing field. There's some great stuff. And we're also going to, in the process of adding some really great segmentation support for our tool, which hopefully will be available in the upcoming months. All right. So All right. To, to be clear for now, we're not talking about segmentation, though, are we? We're talking about the bounding box around objects inside an image, around multiple yes. objects, even multiple kinds of objects inside a single image, not the masking segmentation that goes around it. So when, if you're looking for my face, it's going to be the square like you see on a camera, not an outline where you can cut out the background. Exactly. At this point, that's what we're looking at with this tool. But again, these approaches and the learnings and the open source uh, modules that we've developed as part of this tool, they're reusable and extendable for that type of segmentation as well. And we're, again, we're working on providing that type of what we call polygon annotation into the tool mm -hmm. in future. All right, get at it. So we're not talking about it today, but it's just a matter of time. I know, maybe, maybe a future episode. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, I can't actually, wait for the future episode where we're drawing, we're drawing segmentation lines and we're like, yeah, we're talking about segmentation. We're not talking about, and who knows what the next thing will be. It'll be awesome. Well, and, and that's the beauty of the, sorry, one second, and that's the beauty of like the, this, the segmentation approach is when you think about it, annotating segmentation is, is a very challenging task because, you know, when you're annotating boundary box, it's still, a, you know, a challenging to do this drag and drop and identify where the box is, but when if you just draw a polygon, now you have to connect all these dots. If you have one person doing that process over thousands of objects, over tens of thousands of images, it, becomes, it takes a very, very long time. So what we're also looking forward to doing is, and part of what the reason we just have an out-of-the-box approach that, is we want to come up with smart ways. We want to use specific algorithms that help identify uh, with unsupervised approaches what the base segmentation max is, and then you can extend that. And, and we'll go deeper in that, hopefully, in a, a future episode. Now, you, you mentioned um, active learning. Do you mind expanding a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So the idea of active learning is the ability to integrate your model into the tagging flow. And that's, that's in, in essence, the secret sauce, one of the two pieces of secret sauce with what makes our annotation tool unique versus some of the other open source tools on the market. Essentially, when you think about it, if I'm doing this task, and traditionally I would go to use what are called mechanical Turks, it comes, uh, most people might be familiar with the term. For those who aren't, it comes from the Ottoman Empire. They had, uh, in the streets or bazaars, they had these people who would have a machine, and the machine had like an automaton, and you could play chess with what looked like a robot about in the 1600s. But what was really happening is there was a trap door underneath the chessboard, and there was a person pulling levers. So in the same idea for Mechanical Turks is instead of using algorithms to annotate the data, you have somebody manually go through and do all the hard work of moving the pieces on the chessboard, and in this case, labeling. So traditionally, that's a pretty expensive process. And what you would do is, you would go and get, let's say, 100,000 images. You'd send them to this process. You'd type up a whole docs spec sheet of exactly how everything should be annotated. They give you that back, and then you spend the next six months optimizing your model around this data. Well, the challenge is, what happens now? I have this model. It's not quite what I need, and I get all this new data. I send it back to them, right? And now I have to pay this huge expense, and they don't know what they're tagging whether that actually mm. provides value to our model. So what active learning enables me to do is in that feedback loop process, now I can go, I can tag, annotate my data set, export it, train a model, and actually use that model for the annotation of my remaining data. And that's something that's novel. I haven't seen any other tools on the market that are using that. 
Uh, if they want to reuse our code, again, that's the beauty of open mm -hmm. source. So all, everything's MIT licensed, and we'd be happy to see that happening. And to set expectations properly, I mean, we're not trying to get away from the labor. We know there's going to be labor, both in cost of, of people and time. Yeah. We're trying to minimize it. Exactly. And that's, and that's what it's really about. It's about minimizing the labor and maximizing the gain and the performance of your models. So you're able to export, like, tags and assets? Is that to different frameworks? Is that yeah, so something that's, that the that's, bot tool can do? Yeah, so that's actually the other second part that's really valuable about the bot tool that I haven't seen many other tools do, is if you were to go online right now and search object detection, search, for instance, uh, the state of the art, for instance, is uh, RetinaNet. It's one of the newer models. There's actually, there's another one, but the state of the, it's called uh, LightHead. RetinaNet is the one state of the art with the best, uh, performance and the best support from an engineering team. I can go Google now, search RetinaNet, uh, Lighthead, Kera, uh, RetinaNet, Keras, right? Clone this repository, start uh, tagging some data, generating a model. But what's challenging is there's still work on me as the developer to go and format the data in a way that the tutorial tells me it needs. And the reality is that most of most of the data that uh, is provided out there is not formatted for each of the specific frameworks. Each of the frameworks has a little twist on how they source or they format their data. So the secret sauce of bot is it provides the ability to export data in the format that each of the tutorials state of the art, whether that's the TensorFlow Object Detection API, whether that's CNTK or uh, Keras RetinaNet, it allows you to export your data in exactly the same format. So then all you have to do is just now, change hey, Ari, let, let me stop you just for a second, Ari, and, and let me make sure I understand. So I'm exporting all of this in all the formats that I need. So, you know, I use TensorFlow, so I want everything in that format. Is there an internal format that you guys are storing it as, and then you're exporting yes. it through a conversion? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Yeah, what we use is we have a JSON format that we use to internalize everything based on the tagging component that we've built. But what's really nice is we've built uh, everything to be scalable. So we built uh, a set of, or modular, that's the better word for this. Uh, okay. And we okay. built a set of interfaces that allow you, and, and we support them for all the main frameworks, but allow you to take this and take our format and convert and export into any format you want. And I'll go in, in the demo, I'll dive deeper into what those interfaces look like and how if you're using some custom model or the next gen state of the art, how you can leverage this tool. If I am using Tensor or something like that and I already have my format, I already have some data, am I able to go the other way? Am I able to take the existing data I have, put it up into your tool and be able to use it or is this a one-way conversion? So it's a really good question. There's been a lot of demand for that, and that's something that's on our backlog that we're looking into supporting. Today, it's a one-way export. Okay. Okay. It almost sounds like there's two tools here. There's like a tagging tool and a conversion tool that somehow could be almost used independently. Absolutely. And uh, again, that's some, there, there's aspects of that are in the backlog. And we have some also some other really exciting features in the backlog, like direct integration with uh, Azure storage and uh, event hub so that you can es essentially build a tagging queue and scale each one of these client apps across multiple people. We have different, uh, we have a web version of the tool that people are working on because everything that we develop, we purposely, one of the, the things we saw when we went to develop this tool uh, based on the needs of the partners, we saw that there are a couple of tools that existed in Python already, but that you couldn't reuse it. most most of these tagging flows when we're dealing with mechanical turfs uh, run on web. You provide them a web service. And so the challenge is to take this Python tooling, you know, a TK inter interface, you can't push that into the web. So we purposely engineered things so that it's all in JavaScript, all native JavaScript, and you can take the components of the tool and implement them into any application. What do you think, Sabrina? I think this is really cool. I mean, I would love an opportunity to play around with this tool. Yeah, seems well, really great. Uh, maybe you could give us like the uh, the the Baker's tour of this tool and show us uh, on your screen. 
Absolutely. So here, let me uh, share out my screen.